program is one of six special events uh, hosted by libraries around the state to commemorate the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. Uh, this program, uh, which is part of the Pennsylvania Civil War 150, is uh, made possible by the Pennsylvania Humanities Council uh, with a grant from the, in the U.S. Institute of Museum and Library Services and is it produced in partnership with the Pennsylvania Heritage Society and the State Library of Pennsylvania. Now my goal today is to basically give some introductory remarks uh, and then turn it over to President Lincoln uh, and then also uh, to uh, uh, answer any particular questions you might have for a historian uh, at the end of that. Uh, but my remarks, uh, really I wanted to begin by saying that it is an honor and a privilege to be here today uh, to introduce uh, President Lincoln who will talk to us about Lincoln's many connections to our beloved Keystone State. And I have to say that when I was initially thinking about this, it, it began to dawn on me that I would be making comments about the president in front of him. And uh, I, I nearly lost courage. And so uh, I was tempted to stand up and say that Abraham Lincoln is a man who needs no introduction. <laughs> But, uh, but it is appropriate uh, for me to make some brief remarks uh, about the meaning of Abraham Lincoln uh, and also about uh, the uh, importance of Pennsylvania for the Civil War. And I think it's important to understand that now at the 150th anniversary of the Civil War, Americans are in a better position to understand uh, the meaning of Abraham Lincoln better. Um, we understand Lincoln as the man who preserved the Union and who also uh, freed the slaves. But 50 years ago, at the centennial of that great event, uh, the, the, the horrors of slavery and the legacy of emancipation had essentially been written out of that national story. Uh, that was the era of the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, and yet, uh, it was not an era in which the emancipationist legacy of the war was featured very prominently. In fact, uh, it would be easy for us to forget that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous 1963 March on Washington was itself a cry that America had not lived up to the promises of the Emancipation Proclamation which had come out a hundred years before. So now uh, we are in a better position uh, to appreciate this, and I think we will do better. Um, I also want to pay attention to the idea that at this moment in time, 150 years ago, Abraham Lincoln was on the verge of making his indelible mark on history by proclaiming emancipation. Um, a year after the war had commenced, the, the bloodletting in this conflict was unprecedented. And war weariness was beginning to sap and choke the patriotism and the spirit of sacrifice in the nation. And Lincoln endured some gloomy days of constant shadow and criticism. Uh, in fact, uh, doubters were concerned that Lincoln, a Kentucky-born Midwestern moderate, did not fully understand that you had to make war against both slaveholders and their slavery at the same time. Uh, in fact, many doubters were discouraged when uh, on August 22, 1862, Lincoln made a very famous public statement where he wrote, my paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union and is not either to save or to destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. If I could do it, save it. If I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. But what they could not have known was that at that very moment, Abraham Lincoln had already drafted his Emancipation Proclamation. He had already read it to his cabinet as a sign of his intention. He listened to the word of counsel of the Secretary of State, William Seward, 
who urged him to wait until the Union had a triumph in which to declare freedom. And with victory in Antietam in western Maryland, Lincoln took that first step and declared emancipation on September 22, 1862. And once he had done so, he would never turn backward uh, on what he felt was a moral right. And so at this anniversary of the Civil War, Americans will do better to remember Lincoln as an emancipator. And uh, we will do this because we already, as a nation, do better in describing the horrors of slavery in our schools and in our books and in our historic sites. But the purpose of today, of course, is to talk about Lincoln's connections to Pennsylvania. And I would say that first we should understand that Pennsylvania played a very important role in the outcome of the Civil War. Uh, more than 340,000 Pennsylvanians served in the Union Army. Uh, and uh, Pennsylvanians were among the first to arrive in Washington, D.C. after President Lincoln made his call for 75,000 men. Um, although initially the war did not, the, the War Department did not accept the service of African American men, it was Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 that opened the door for their honorable service. And by war's end, more than 8,600 black Pennsylvanians had served in the military. Philadelphia's Camp William Penn had trained 11 regiments of black troops. And by war's end, more than 33,000 Pennsylvanians uh, soldiers had died uh, in service, and thousands, countless more, bore the physical and mental scars of war forever. Pennsylvania also contributed mightily in other ways. Local communities throughout the Commonwealth, uh, in order to help troops in the field, uh, they sent forward uh, goods uh, and other useful things that soldiers could uh, benefit from at the front. They also engaged in acts of charity, like the great sanitary fairs, not something having anything to do with cleanliness per se, but gigantic patriotic outbursts, uh, often lasting for days. They were held in 1864 in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and other communities in between. And they raised thousands, aggregate across the north of millions of dollars for the war effort. Um, also, we might point out that industrial centers like Pittsburgh and Philadelphia produced mountains of war goods over the course of the conflict. Uh, one could observe almost ceaseless toil in the cannon foundries of Pittsburgh or the shipyards of Philadelphia or the uniform manufactories of that city as well. Uh, and such work could be dangerous, such as at the Allegheny Arsenal in Pittsburgh, when in September of 1862, an explosion there took the lives of mostly women uh, who worked at making ammunition for the War Department, uh, in which 78 people died. But it was also true that farmers of this great agricultural state, they picked up uh, efforts for the war and contributed flour, fodder, livestock for the war effort. We also know that the state's great natural resources were in great demand. Uh, coal, timber, uh, iron, petroleum. Um, and it's also true that uh, there are other ways in which Pennsylvania contributed. The Great Pennsylvania Railroad was a major artery running through the state, connecting vast stretches of the north with the capital, and was a major conduit of the movement of men and materials uh, on the way to the Virginia front. Um, and lest we forget that wars are won with money as well as men, we should remember that uh, Jay Cook and Company of Philadelphia had a major responsibility for financing the war effort and for popularizing war bonds among or ordinary Americans. But um, we would also want to talk about Lincoln's connections in a political sense to the state. Uh, and here, of course, we might say that Lincoln would surely recognize kindred spirits. Uh, while he was not from Pennsylvania, uh, he was from a border region, uh, as we are. 
Uh, and uh, of course, here in the hometown of Governor Andrew Greg Curtin, uh, it would be wrong for us not to mention those influential Pennsylvania politicians uh, that played a role uh, in the war effort. For instance, Governor Curtin. Governor Curtin was a man who came to be known as the soldier's friend. He represented the powerful iron interests of the state, the tremendous political influence. Uh, and throughout the war, he did his best to pitch into the war effort. And in September of 1862, he became famous for holding a conference of loyal war governors to rally support and coordinate the efforts to, to support the war. But other Pennsylvanians figured prominently as well. Uh, Thaddeus Stevens, uh, a man who in the, the House of Representatives was one of the most fervent uh, of radical uh, abolitionists. He was a, a, a leader of the radical wing of the party, constantly urging President Lincoln toward the issue of emancipation. Simon Cameron, the other end of the Republican spectrum, we might say, who uh, Lincoln appointed as his first Secretary of War. Uh, was probably one of the most influential politicians in the state and perhaps also one of the most troubling. Uh, we'll see if the president agreed. Um, and uh, although we might risk uh, bringing up bad memories to President Lincoln, we might mention that General George B. McClellan, also hailed from Philadelphia, a former general of the army, also ran against the president and lost happily, we might add, uh, in the 1864 election as the Democratic candidate. But General McClellan was uh, also joined in the field by dozens of Pennsylvania officers, uh, among whom were General Meade, Winfield Scott Hancock, John Reynolds, John Geary, Naval Admiral David Porter, and many, many others. Lastly, uh, we would remember the deepest connection between Lincoln and Pennsylvania, and that is in his immortal Gettysburg Address. Uh, Lincoln delivered the Gettysburg Address in November of 1863 at the dedication of the National Cemetery at that place. And generations of school children have learned that by heart and, uh, and studied carefully its calls to national patriotism and devotion. Uh, even my wife, who was born and raised in Japan, learned in schools of that great address and could quote the section about government of the people, by the people, for the people, which gives you some sense of the, the testament of those uh, enduring words, not only here in the United States, but across the world. Uh, and lastly, I would say that without delay, the goal here is to, to, to leave room for Lincoln to talk about his connections to Pennsylvania. And so I would like to introduce to you the featured speaker for today, President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. Thank you, Doctor. Well, I am real pleased to be in Pennsylvania, the home of Andrew Greg Curtin here in Belfont, Pennsylvania. And I have to say, I really appreciate being here. It gives me a chance, you know, to take a look at you and gives you a chance to take a look at me. And after shaking many of your hands and taking a close look at you people, all I got to say is, I got the best of that bargain. <laughs> now, I'm going to be right here. You know, as a politician, I'm used to working both sides of the aisle, so I won't have any problem. But what I want to talk about a little bit today is I want to start off right off the bat by telling you I feel a lot better today than the first time I was in central Pennsylvania with Andrew Gray Curtin. Now, how that came about after I was elected the 16th president of November on February the 11th, I left my home in Springfield, walked down to the train station and boarded what they called the inaugural train that would take me from Springfield to Washington to be inaugurated as the 16th president. Now being a politician, along the way I stopped to meet and greet the people. I remember in Pennsylvania, I think we stopped at Rochester, Pittsburgh, went on over to Philadelphia, up into Lancaster, and then into Harrisburg where I was to meet Governor Curtin, I'm going to address the joint legislature. Now accompanying me on that inaugural train was my wife Mary, along with my sons Robert, Willie, and Tad. Now Robert, being the oldest, I gave him a job to do. 
I said, Robert, I want you to take care of my valise. Now, inside that valise was my personal effects, but most importantly, the only copy that I had of the inaugural address I was going to deliver in Washington. Well, when we got to Harrisburg, I had some time, so I thought, well, I think I'll work on my inaugural address. I said, Robert, bring me my valise. Well, wouldn't you know it, he lost it. Yeah. And I, many an anxious hour before they, they brought me my valise it was in the baggage car. Well, when I opened up that valise and I took out the only copy that I had of the inaugural address, well, that reminds me of a story of the farmer who sold some land and got $1,500 in his pocket, right in his hand. He said, well, I think I'll put this in a bank, get some interest, safe keep it. Well, wouldn't you know it, the bank failed and he got 10 cents on the dollar. So when he got that $150 in his hand, he thought, well, I think I'll put it in another bank, make some interest and safe keep it. Wouldn't you know it, that bank failed too. And again, he got 10 cents on the dollar. So when he got that $15 in his hand, he said, now by God, I've got you reduced to portable size. <laughs> and I'm going to put you in my pocket. That's what I did with my inaugural address. The second reason I feel a lot better today than I did then was it was in Harrisburg that I learned that there was going to be an attempt on my life in Baltimore. Now, I was no stranger to attacks on my person, but this was a little different. I got it from two different sources. General Scott, he had, one of his troops had told him that the, they had heard in Baltimore it was going to be an attempt on his life. So he told my soon-to-be Secretary of State, William Seward, and he sent his son Frederick up to Harrisburg to warn me. Well, he no sooner left than I got another person. You might have heard this guy, the famous Alan Pinkerton of the Pinkerton Detective Agency. He said one of his operatives heard that there was going to be an attack on my life. So since I got it from two independent sources, I thought, well, I better heed. And here again, Governor Curtin came to the rescue. He arranged for me to supposedly going back to his place and what we did on the carriage, he took a circuitous route to the Harrisburg train station. I boarded the train in Harrisburg, went down to Philadelphia, changed trains, went through Baltimore in the dead of night without stopping. Arrived in Washington safe and sound. So you can see I feel a lot better today than the first time I was in central Pennsylvania. Now, I love Pennsylvania and I have a great love for Pennsylvania because you see, I have deep roots in Pennsylvania. See, my people who were Quakers, they come over to this country from England way back in the 1630s and they settled up in Hingham, Massachusetts. One thing about the Lincolns, boy, they sure did move a lot. They moved probably for the same reason many of you moved, a new job or a better job, maybe more productive land. So they moved a few times up there in Massachusetts, would come on down into New Jersey where my great-great-grandfather, Mordecai Lincoln, worked as an iron worker. Well, Mordecai and his brother, Abraham, they left New Jersey, went into Pennsylvania. Now, Andrew, on the other side of the family, he settled outside of Philadelphia in a little place called Darby, Pennsylvania. They tell me that there's still people from the Lincoln lineage still living in Darby. Now, on my side of the family, Mordecai, he settled at, along near the Schuylkill River, wound up in Redding, right outside of Redding, where he was neighbors with the Boone family. In fact, he built a home in Birdsboro, Pennsylvania, way back in the 1730s that they tell me that today is still standing. In fact, my great-great-grandfather is buried in a Quaker graveyard right outside of Birdsboro with some of the Boone. Now Mordecai, he had a son, John, my great-grandfather, John Lincoln. Yep. And he married a Lancaster gal by the name of Rebecca Flowers. And they had a son, born in Pennsylvania, Abraham, my namesake. 
I think that would be a good thing uh, for the historical society to, to look up, you know, just exactly where in Pennsylvania Abraham was born, my grandfather, because that's a little murky records back in those days. But you can see why I have a great love for Pennsylvania, because I have deep roots in Pennsylvania. Now, my first visit to Pennsylvania was way back in 1848 when I attended the Whig Presidential Convention in Philadelphia. Now, the Whigs were my political party at that time. Now, I wasn't a delegate, but I had come to Washington, uh, to Philadelphia, to see how it worked. But more importantly, the walk in the footsteps of our founding fathers in Philadelphia. You see, I have great reverence for our founding fathers, especially our founding fathers' plan that they put in place to eliminate slavery. Oh, yes. You see, our founding fathers, they were very familiar with slavery. They knew that the first Spanish colony, St. Augustine, had slaves. The first English colony, way back in 1619, Jamestown, Virginia, had slaves. So when they met in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, to form a new government, they said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. But all men are created equal, and they are endowed under their creator with certain unalienable rights, among those the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And our founding father said, now, if we can't settle the issue of slavery where it currently exists, we're going to do the next best thing. We're not going to let slavery grow. And if slavery can't grow, over time, the nutrients in the soil necessary to grow the cotton and the tobacco will diminish. Therefore, the size of the crops will diminish. Ergo, the need for slaves will diminish. And then slavery will die a natural death. And those just weren't idle words of our founding fathers. No. When we gain more lands, as a result of the Revolutionary War, the Treaty of Paris, 1783, the Continental Congress passed the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. And that Northwest Ordinance said that slavery in all the territories that we've acquired as a result of the Revolutionary War, slavery is prohibited in all those lands. Yeah. So you see, the plan was in effect, the elimination of slavery. And when they met again in Philadelphia, to form a more perfect union, to establish justice, to ensure domestic tranquility, to provide for the common defense, to promote general welfare, and to secure the blessings of liberty for themselves and their posterity, they spoke volumes by never mentioning the word slavery in the Constitution of the United States of America. And they went even further. They put a plan in effect for the gradual elimination of the international trade of such persons. So the question was settled. But then, as you know, we gained more lands as a result of the Louisiana Purchase. And what are we going to do about slavery in those lands? And that led to the famous Missouri Compromise, the Compromise of 1820, where they drew a line 36 degrees, 30 minutes across the United States, and they said all lands north of that line that we've acquired as a result of the Louisiana Purchase, slavery is prohibited in all those lands. Again, the question was settled. But then you know we gained more lands as a result of the Mexican War. And what are we going to do about slavery in those lands? And that led to the Compromise of 1850, where again the question was settled, although an easy, uneasy one, until 1854, when Senator Stephen A. Douglas from my home state of Illinois had passed through Congress the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And that Kansas-Nebraska Act said in effect that slavery could now extend into the new territories, reversing that policy that had been put in effect by our founding fathers to eliminate slavery. Well, that so inflamed the country that the political parties went into uproar. The Whig Party imploded. And out of that Whig Party, in 1854, came a new party, the Republican Party. 
and it was based on old line Whigs, anti-slavery Democrats, free soilers, the American Party. And they met, guess where they met to have their first presidential convention, the first Republican presidential convention, in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, where they took in their platform all of the results and the plans of our founding fathers to eliminate slavery into their platform. And they held the first raid in Philadelphia. Now, they elected, they put up for election John Fremont. They had a great slogan. Free speech, free soil, free men, free Mont. Well, it was a good slogan, but it didn't do them much any good. But another Pennsylvania come in, James Buchanan. But that was important for me for another reason. During that convention of 1856 was the first time that I gained national recognition. Man. Somebody put my name on the first ballot for vice president. And I received 110 votes for vice president. Well, my friend said that the delegates came to their senses and put old guy from New Jersey on the second ballot. But nevertheless, that was my first national exposure. So that in 1860, when we held the second Republican convention in Chicago, I was on as one of the persons running to get the nomination as a favorite son from Illinois. But there were a lot of qualified people. William Seward, who I heard you mention, from New York was there, the odds-on favorite. Salmon Chase from Ohio, Edwin Bates from Missouri, and from Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Simon Cameron, Pennsylvania's favorite son. Now, in the needed 233 votes, as I remember, to get the nomination. Now, on the first ballot, Seward, the odds-on favorite, he got about 173 or four. I got 100. I think, uh, I know Simon Cameron got over 50, and I think Chase and Bates got 49 and 48, respectively. But here again, I could not have received a nomination if it wasn't for Pennsylvania. Because on the second ballot, Simon Cameron and Andrew Gray Curtin arranged for the delegates to throw all their votes into my column. And that started the momentum, and I was received a nomination on the third ballot. And as you know, went on to become the president. Now, when I became president, I knew the times were perilous, and I knew I needed help. So I thought, well, who best? But maybe this team of rivals, so-called. Maybe I could put them into my cabinet. And that's what I did. William Sue was Secretary of State. Salmon Chase, Secretary of the Treasury, Edwin Bates, Attorney General. The only problem that I had was when I went to come to put Simon Cameron into my cabinet. And the problem came from his home state of Pennsylvania. Yeah, we had a, they had a delegation from Pennsylvania come see me. Uh, they said, Mr. President, you don't put Simon Cameron in your cabinet. I said, well, why not? They said, well, Mr. President, do you know what Simon Cameron's definition is of an honest politician? I said, no, I don't. I said, Simon Cameron's definition of an honest politician is one who, once he's bought, stays bought. Well, I thought that was funny. And I said, no, you don't mean to tell me that you think Simon Cameron would steal. Well, Thaddeus Stevens stood up from Lancaster and he said, Mr. President, I do not believe that Simon Cameron would steal a red-hot stove. Well, I thought that was humorous, and I was telling my cabinet, and so next time I saw Thaddeus Stevens, I said, boy, that was really funny. He said, well, Mr. President, there was one man who didn't think it was funny at all. That's Simon Cameron. And he's demanding a retraction. And Mr. President, that's what I'm here for. I think I told you that I did not think that Simon Cameron would steal a red-hot stove. I now retract that statement. <laughs> well, what happened, the Pennsylvania folks, they removed their objections to Simon Cameron, and, and uh, I made him the Secretary of War, and then a year later made him Minister to Justice, uh, uh, the Minister to Russia, and then uh, put a longtime Pittsburgh resident in his place, Edwin Stanton. So you can see how Pennsylvania has been real important to me. In fact, we could not have brought the Civil War to a successful conclusion 
without Pennsylvania's political help on all levels of government. In the Senate, David Wilmot, he of the epitomous Wilmot Proviso. David and I, we went way back in our days in Congress when he kept putting that Wilmot Proviso that said that slavery could not be in any lands that we've gained as a result of the Mexican War. I must have voted for that bill 40 times or so. It kept getting killed in the Senate. But he was a big help in the Senate. And in the House, you heard a doctor talk about Thaddeus Stevens. He was chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. As you know, all money bills originate in the House. So when the Fort Sumter was attacked in April, I called out for 75 militiamen. Well, I didn't have any money to pay them. And in record time, Thaddeus Stevens introduced a bill, had it out on the floor, put it in committee, got it out of committee, back on the floor to be voted on, and by the end of April we had the money that we needed to pay those troops. Great job by Thaddeus Stevens. Record time. In fact, another time I asked for 400000 and on his own he raised it to 500000 And as you heard the doctor say, he was a staunch abolitionist, so the only reason bone of contention we had early on was he didn't think I was moving fast enough on the issue of slavery. But after the Emancipation Proclamation, he felt a lot better on it. Now at the state level, Andrew Greg Curtin, good friend of mine, you heard me talk of him. Now, he was a man of tact and planning. He kept the militia together, so much so that when I called for the troops, as you heard the doctor say, Pennsylvania, the first offenders were the first to arrive. I knew then rebels could knock, but they weren't getting in. That was Andrew Gay Curtin. In addition, he established a military training facility in Harrisburg. Later on, it was called Camp Curtin. It was the largest training facility in the North. In fact, it was the largest North or South. Over 300,000 soldiers passed through Camp Curtin, all because of him, his early planning and foresight. And of course, he bought the lands after the Battle of Gettysburg and arranged for a cemetery and asked me there for the dedication. But you also heard the doctor mention the first loyal governor's conference called by Andrew Gregg Curtin. Now, this was very important because he called it was in September of 1862 and it was in Altoona at the Logan Hotel. And all the loyal governors came there and on the agenda were two items. How can we, what can we do to assist Abraham Lincoln in carrying the war effort to a successful conclusion? And number two, what can we do to assist him in the implementation of the Emancipation Proclamation? And they worked together and they came to Washington and delivered their resolution. And I, I'll tell you, that was vitally important to me because I knew then that I had the support of the people and we could carry the Civil War to a successful conclusion. Now, many of you have not heard about that because they, they didn't keep any minutes. So nobody knew that, but I'll tell you, Andrew Gray Curtin's thing was of vital importance to me. Now, my last visit to Pennsylvania was back in June of 1864 when Mary and I attended what they called a sanitary commission fair in Philadelphia at Logan Circle. Now, you may not know this, for every person, soldier, killed in battle, two died of disease. Most of that was by the dysentery and typhoid caused by the unsanitary conditions in the army camps. So a group of civilians got together and formed a sanitary commission. And their goal was to improve the conditions in the camp, to help save lives, provide humanitarian effort for the troops. It was the largest civilian effort in the war. It was the only one that was started by civilians, run by civilians, and financed by civilians. Now, the way, one of the ways they did to raise troops, or money rather, for the troops, was they had these what they called fairs. And uh, you heard mention of that by the doctor. Now, the one in Philadelphia I attended, here again, Pennsylvania, raised over a million dollars, the largest of any of those sanitary fairs. Here again, Pennsylvania, as you can see, why I never hesitate to call Pennsylvania my personal Keystone State. And I always shout out loud that I am Pennsylvania proud. Now, since we're here in Pennsylvania, I suppose I would be remiss if I didn't finish my remarks with the address that I made on the 19th of November 
1863 at the dedication of the cemetery at Gettysburg. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now, we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for all those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is for us rather to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to the cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, and that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Thank you. <clears throat> now I'd like to invite Doctor up and uh, we'll be glad to try and answer any questions that you might have. And if they're very difficult, there's the man. Very diplomatically put. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I was going to use the same strategy uh, for you. Uh, so uh, if you'd like to ask a question, we'd appreciate if you could step up to the microphone and we're eager to see what you want to know.